Good morning, church. Let me try that again. Good morning, church. Yes, welcome. Welcome to Dongshan English Service. My name is uh, SJ, or my full Korean name is Sung Jin, but I go by SJ. So you're, you, you can feel free to address me either way. Uh, I'm one of the deacons here, um, and it's a privilege to greet all of you today to our service. So why don't we turn to the person next to us uh, and behind us, in front of you. Just greet them, say welcome. So happy to worship with you. So let's uh, greet each other. All right, before we move on, uh, is there anyone who is visiting us for the first time today? If you can maybe, thank you. So let's welcome them with an applause. So great to have you with us today. Uh, please uh, stop, uh, don't leave right away. Please uh, meet with our pastor and our deacons. Uh, we would love to get to know you better. So next, birthday. Every first week of the month, we celebrate the birthdays in that month. So we have birthdays. Uh, happy birthday to Dee, William, Alex, Jonathan, Stephanie, Emma, and Deacon James. Is it this James or that James? The back James, okay? Dr. James. Okay, so the names and the dates are on the board, uh, so please congratulate our members and celebrate with them. Uh, those of you who have birthdays on, in June, please see Pastor, John, uh, Pastor Samuel as well at the end of the service. We have a small gift for you. Next, important announcement. Uh, the deacons have met and we discussed, as you can see in front of me today, since COVID-19, this I think it's been two years since we've, uh, ever since we've been able to partake in communion. So as we resume our communion, we had a meeting together to discuss about how can we include as many people uh, in, in, in partaking uh, communion. And so uh, we have decided that uh, if we can show the slide. So... Uh, communion, we recommend, is only for those who believe in Jesus and have accepted him as, uh, as your own Savior and have been baptized, okay? Uh, there are other, implica uh, other important information, but that will be explained by Pastor Samuel. Uh, so for those of you who have been baptized as an infant, we want to hold uh, a confirmation class. Pastor Samuel will be available on June 12th at 2.30, so after service, or June 19th at 1.30 p.m. And the room, uh, the location will be on the fourth floor, just above our, our room here, on the fourth floor, 404. So the confirmation class, the purpose of this class will be to explain and to learn about what communion is and who is able to partake in the communion, okay? So, uh, and the children are also invited. Um, and if you have not been baptized and have not gone through the confirmation class, we want to ask you politely to hold off on partaking in the communion and because we will be taking, uh, having communion every month. So after you uh, participate this class, you will be able to join us in communion the following month. So, uh, and children as well. So... Uh, for children, if you are old enough and you believe that you can, you trust the Lord and you want to be a part of our member, uh, please attend this class with your parents, and we would love to have you join us in communion, okay? So uh, that's the important announcement today. Uh, another additional information is that once you take this once, that will be enough, okay? You won't be required to attend additional classes, just one class uh, before you can attend, uh, partake in our communion. Okay, next announcement. Uh, thankfully, uh, we have, we, we are growing here uh, with uh, the removal of COVID-19 restrictions. We have more members attending our service, which is great. Uh, and thankfully, we were able to uh, receive another room upstairs, 404, uh, so this room will be available for our children, okay? So we want to make sure that the adults attending the service are not distracted, 
and are able to fully focus in our service. So for the children, parents with children, we want to ask you, uh, if your child is able to um, attend the service without causing any distraction, they are welcome to stay with us in the room. But if you feel that your child needs a little more freedom to, do, to run around maybe, uh, we want to highly encourage you to use the room upstairs uh, where it will be free and the children will be able to do different activities and just uh, be a little more free uh, under free environment, okay? Uh, if your child is younger, uh, younger than five, like my children, my two younger children, uh, we have a room in the back, uh, nursery room, so that room will be, will be available for younger children. For anyone older, the room upstairs. Uh, we want to highly encourage you to make use of that room, okay? Also, one last information. Uh, we have some of our members, including myself, uh, who leave during the service uh, to pick up our children who are attending the Korean service. Uh, once you pick them up, we want to ask you also to go uh, upstairs to room 404 until the service finishes, and then you can come back down here after the service so that the adults attending the service uh, can focus without having being distracted by the children, okay? So... Please don't be offended uh, about this. We love the children, okay? I have three children. We have three children here. We love our children, but we also do want to make sure that the adults are able to focus in our service and the sermon, okay? So thank you for your understanding. Um, I think that's about all the announcements that I have today. The other, other announcements, you can refer to the bulletin, okay? So next, let's go to our... Uh, scripture today, John chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. Uh, let me read this, and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to gather together to worship you and to glorify you as a body of Christ. As we come before your presence, we pray that you would fill our hearts, unite our hearts with your spirit. Humble us, teach us, bring our hearts, and turn our eyes to you, Lord. We pray that you would remove any distractions that may be in our minds, in our hearts, in our thoughts. We pray that you would help us to focus on you alone today as we worship you and glorify you. May you alone be glorified today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to church. It's so good to see you guys. Um, I wanted to share a scripture with you today. Um, we have a new uh, song that we're doing, and this is the foundational scripture for it. I just want to share it with you. Um, it comes from Jeremiah 10, verse 6. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due for among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms. There is none like you. So I want to get a little participation from you guys. If you could turn to your neighbors and say, there is nobody like Jesus. There is nobody like Jesus. Good. Turn to your next neighbor. There is no one like Jesus. There is no one like Jesus. Good. All right. Let's stand up and worship God together today. Um, so this song is very upbeat, high energy, and it's more of a call and response. So it's more of a repeat after me and sing after me, if that makes sense, Okay. So we have our worship leaders over here who are going to also sing, so maybe just follow them to help you follow the song, okay? Here we go.
Back to the top, Yahweh. 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 Holy is your name. Holy is your I name. I don't want to take it in vain. I don't want to take it in vain. Yahweh. 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 Holy is your name. Holy is your I name. I don't want to take it in vain. I don't want to take it in vain. There will be. Back to Yahweh. Lover of my soul, lover of 
of my soul. Sing it if you got it. Lover of my soul. Lover of my soul.
given us another chance, another opportunity to come and worship you, to pour our love and gratitude on you, Lord. We're so grateful for this moment that you've given us to worship. God, I pray that the service that happens in this room today, the words that come from the pastor's mouth, communion that's going to happen later, God. I pray that in those moments, you are revered, you are worshiped, you are glorified, and that everything that falls in our hearts, falls in hearts that are softened and ready to receive the word from you, Lord. And I pray that whatever they're here today changes us, makes us better, and ready to chase after you. And above all things, I pray 
Let your name be glorified. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Good to see you all. Give me one sec. Okay. Um, let me briefly go over the announcements uh, once more. A um, few things. Um, first of all, again, good to see you, by the way. Um, parents with children, uh, again, to minimize distractions, we, we ask, we kindly ask the parents to uh, join um, our worship in either our nursery room, if your children are too young, or uh, they're old, but they can really concentrate, then they can uh, also worship upstairs, right above this room. And um, if you leave the worship in the middle to pick up your kids, uh, you can please return to room upstairs and, and remain there for the, uh, uh, remain, uh, the, for the rest of the service, uh, starting next week, uh, not right away because that's too mean. So starting next week or even two weeks, um, but right, because we want to uh, stay focused and uh, we love kids, but um, you can, you can, you know, your kids can be loud upstairs and have, uh, have fun up there. So thank you for understanding. And um, parents with older children, uh, please remind your children to be careful and mindful of younger children. Right? After the service, when they're playing, when they're running around after the service, because we have younger children, right? Please keep that in mind um, um, to be careful, right? Remind your children to be careful, please. And confirmation class, um, this applies to you if you have been baptized as an infant, but you didn't go through the, the so-called the confirmation process, which is you haven't made a public proclamation of, of faith, right? So we want to help you to do so uh, because this process will provide an opportunity for you to make sure you understand the gospel and the basic doctrines of, of the Christian faith and thus be able to uh, confidently and public, publicly profess your faith so that we as a church can also recognize you and bless you and support you, right? So please, if you're baptized as an infant but you never went through um, the confirmation process, please talk to me so that after the class, an interview with the deacons, they're good people, by the way, and, and, and after that, we want to have um, Confirmation Sunday, where I'm going to ask you to stand and answer the questions that I ask you, which is basically, do you believe in Jesus? Uh, do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Stuff like that. And just say amen, and, and you can participate in the Lord's Supper to, again, to help you to understand these things, uh, what the Lord's Supper is and what uh, um, salvation is, right? So thank you. Um, okay. Um, all right. Please turn with me. Before we do so, please, um, we did uh, welcome uh, and greet one another, but before we do so, please uh, turn to your friend next to you and say, have you been born again? Ask that question. Have you been born again? Because you must. Um, please turn with me to John 3, 1 through 8. John 3, 1 through 8. John 3, 1 through 8. Uh, let me read verse 1, and you guys read the next one, and we're going to go from there, alternating. This is what um, the Lord says, the Bible says. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Okay. 
Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. It blows where it wishes, and you hear sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives us the new birth so that we may believe in Jesus, we, were, we who are dead in sin. Father, as we talk about this important matter, oh God, open our eyes. Oh God, open our hearts to see and understand and embrace the truth. Jesus said, you must be born again if you want to enter my kingdom. Oh, Father, we pray, I pray, that all of us in this room are born again by your grace, by your spirit. Help us. Protect us, O oh God. Help us to, again, stay focused and, and understand and do the word. Bless these people whom you love. Protect us, guide us through this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, we began a new series on salvation and discussed what salvation is and how we can receive it. Yes, we are saved from sin, but ultimately we're saved from, remember, the holy wrath of God against sin and sinners. And we learn that the only way to be delivered from his wrath is by repenting of our sins and believing in the gospel of Jesus. Because there are so many gospels out there, right? Of Jesus that Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience and righteousness for you and died for your sin. And three days later, he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, so that we who trust in the person and work of Jesus might be saved and enjoy eternal life. These sermons on salvation, friends, are connected with one another, and they logically and theologically point us to the following messages. And a crucial question that we must consider in today's message is, okay, we must repent and believe in Jesus to be saved, uh, but how is this possible? We need to be able to answer this question. How is that possible? What do you mean? Why am I asking this question? It's because, as we saw, we're sinners by nature, right, who by nature hate and resist God and his truth then how can we or anyone who are God's enemies, hater of God, obey his word and thus repent and believe in the gospel by his own power and will? You see? Okay, you're telling me to believe in the, in the gospel, but I'm a sinner. I don't like that. I don't care about the gospel. You see? How, how is it possible? This is the reason why we want to look at John 3 today, where we find one of the most important teachings of Jesus about salvation and the, and the answer to our question. Here Jesus tells us that, friends, something must take place if anyone wants to see or enter God's kingdom. In other words, be saved by repenting and believing in Jesus. And that something, has, and that, something that has to happen does not refer to faith. I'm not talking about faith. That does not refer to repentance. It's something else. In fact, Jesus talks about faith explicitly right after our passage in verses 15 and 16. Again, which is not that something that he mentions in our passage. That something and faith, friends, which result in salvation, which are essential elements of salvation, are two different things. But without that something... Even faith, which is necessary for salvation, is unattainable. You can't, have, you can't have faith without this something. 
So today we're going to discuss what this something is, which must take place in our lives. But you already know what it is, right? Yes, amen. But just look at the title, you must be born again, right? And how it is closely related to faith, new birth, which leads to salvation and whose work it is. You know, the, work, uh, the new birth, whose work it is, under three points. And by doing so, we want to understand salvation better, more deeply and biblically, and thus love, obey, serve, treasure, and worship the one who alone does this amazing, this gracious, this vital, and miraculous work in our lives increasingly. So the first truth that Jesus tells us is straightforward. One must be born again if he or she wants to be saved. You must be born again, friends. All of you, including me. Verse 3. Let's look at verse 3. You ready? Here we go. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. These are the words of Jesus to Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, and not only that, a member of the Sanhedrin, which was a governing body of the Jews that, consists, that, that comprises of 71 members, the su supreme religious and political body with the highest authority and power. So Nicodemus was a respected governor, maybe even senator, right? But also a top theologian, professor of the Old Testament. And to this expert of the law, Jesus says, I don't care who you are, unless one is born again, he cannot see or enter God's kingdom. And we better, friends, pay attention, but extra, extra, extra attention to these words of Jesus. Why? Because he begins with this expression, truly, truly. It's very important. It's very important. You don't want to miss that. Which is translated from the Greek word, amen, that comes from a root that means certainty, surely. And it, as D.A. Carson explains, Jesus begins with this expression to emphasize the truthfulness and importance of what he's about to say. So he's saying, you better listen to this, memorize this. Then Jesus speaks of the new birth or regeneration, which is the same as being born again, even to, to Nicodemus, who is a Jew, right? God's chosen people an expert of God's law, and fervent keeper of the law to teach us that entrance to God's kingdom does not depend on one's ethnicity, background, effort, deeds, and the rest, right? Not even participation in the Lord's Supper. And Jesus clearly and emphatically says that the new birth, friends, is an essential, is, a, is an absolutely necessary condition, right? Prerequisite for entering God's kingdom, which means if you're not born again, if you're not born again, you cannot see his kingdom. It's impossible. Because he says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The new birth is not optional, friends. It's not optional. So, friends, have you been born again? Have you been born again? But what does it mean that one must be born again if he or she wants to see the kingdom of God? And aren't regeneration and the new birth and salvation the same? No, they're not. Regeneration or the new birth, I'm sorry, regeneration is an essential element part of salvation. And regeneration, friends, must precede faith that leads to salvation. Again, regeneration or new birth must precede faith 
that results in salvation. Let's look at this salvation equation. Again, the new birth, regeneration, allows for faith to happen. Leads to faith, which leads to salvation. Many Christians believe that it is faith in Jesus that leads to the new birth, right? Many of you, right? Believe in Jesus and you'll be born again. But as I just explained, the new birth must precede, come before faith that results in salvation. Why? Because of who we are. Because of our spiritual condition. We're not that nice, unfortunately. We're horrible. Clueless about the things of God. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, speaks of our hopeless spiritual condition. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2. Let's read these two verses. Here we go. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's who we are. You're a worshiper of Satan. You're a follower of Satan. You're dead in sin. We're not decent people. Why must the new birth, which is, in, which is an essential part of salvation and not the same thing as salvation, come before faith? That results in salvation. Again, it's because, as we read, a spiritually dead person, a sinner, all of us, is unable to understand, unable to embrace and trust in the things of God. Do anything that pleases God, including belief in the gospel. Just as a dead corpse is unable to do anything. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.14 adds and says this, right? 1 Corinthians 2.14. Here we go. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Right? The natural person, friends, us, a spiritually dead man who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, cannot, cannot, impossible, cannot understand and accept the things of God, including the gospel. That's why they laugh at the gospel. What do you mean Jesus died for me? 2000, this Jew. And accept the things of God and thus believe in it. So God has to first give us the new birth, you see? Revive our souls that are so dead to the things of God so that we might be able to trust in Jesus. And thus be saved. That's the right order. And that's what I believe that Paul is saying in Ephesians 2.5. Right? Let's look at Ephesians 2.5. Here we go. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. Right? We haven't trusted in Jesus yet. You see? Even when we're still a sinner, God raised us. Gave us the new birth so that, and then the rest. You're going to see famous Ephesians 2.8, right? Again, made us alive, yes. Here, of course, can also mean salvation in a, in a broad sense. But if we want to be more precise and biblical, it's better to call it regeneration or the new birth, which allows a sinner, again, who is dead, a Satan worshiper, to trust in Jesus because we are not saved until we actually Trust in Jesus, right? And again, Paul has not, at least not yet, spoken of faith. And there's no salvation without faith in Jesus. So, the expression made us alive most likely refers to regeneration. But just three verses later, in verse 8, then finally, after all this, right? You were dead in sin, but God gave you the new birth. Then, Verse 8, Paul says, let's read this famous passage. Here we go. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. You see the logic, right? Now, Paul talks about both faith and salvation. 
So God first made us a follower of Satan, lover of Satan, who are spiritually dead and thus unable to understand and embrace the things of God, alive spiritually, meaning gave us the new birth, so that we can believe in Jesus and therefore receive salvation, which regeneration, faith, and salvation, all of them are 100% the gracious gift of God. Even your faith, even your regeneration, of course, you're a dead man, you can't do nothing about it. And for these reasons, I believe that this statement from Ligonier Ministries is very helpful and biblical. Let me read it to you. Just listen to it, right? Very amazing. It says this, we don't come to Christ to be born again. Rather, we're born again in order to come to Christ. Let me repeat that. We don't come to Christ to be born again. Because you can't do nothing when you're dead in sin. Rather, we are born again through the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about it. In order to come to Christ in faith. Jesus teaches us this profound and crucial truth that many miss. Oh, yeah, have faith in Christ. It's up to you. Then you'll be born again. Then you'll be saved. No. One must be born again if he and she wants to be saved. Jesus goes on and teaches us that second, the new birth, regeneration is the sovereign. Sovereign meaning God does everything he pleases, everything that he wants to do according to his will. It does not depend on us or circumstances, right? Uh, the new birth is the sovereign and gracious work of the Holy Spirit alone. It's not up to you. It doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on me. It's his work. Verse 5. Verse 5. Here we go. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now he's talking about water. Again, as we learned, we want to pay extra attention, friends, to these words because it begins what, with what uh, expression? Truly, truly. You better remember that. And here, Jesus is teaching us the same truth that he began discussing in verse 3. He reveals more information now and says that no one is able to enter God's kingdom unless one is born of water and the Spirit, which is the same as being born again. Verse 3. The point of this truth is clear, dear friends. You must, without exception, born of water and the Spirit if you want to enter God's kingdom. But what does this expression, right, being born of water and the Spirit mean? Water and the Spirit, friends, point to one same thing, one common thing, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. Some people believe that water here refers to baptism, right? They say, oh, you have to be baptized, and then you need to be born of the Spirit. However, we believe that that's not the case. Why? First, Jesus does not speak of baptism, not even once in this text, later on only. When he talks about being born of the Spirit two more times in verse 6 and verse 8. Also, as we know from the Bible, dear friends, baptism does not produce the new birth, right? It doesn't do anything, actually, if you don't have faith in Christ. But the Catholics believe that it does something. It gives you new life. No. The baptism does not produce the new birth. Rather, baptism is, in simple words, a visible sign or picture of the new birth and union with Christ through his righteous and cleansing work of the cross. So you're baptized because you're born again and thus believe in Jesus and not in order to be born again. Right? In addition, God already spoke of water and the Spirit jointly in the Old Testament many, many times. When he promised the sinful Israelites who are spiritually dead that he's going to cleanse them. He said, I'm going to cleanse you from your sin and I'm going to give you new heart, living heart, so that you might follow me, so that you might keep my commandments. I'm going to do that. 
Ezekiel, one of my favorite passages, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Here we go. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you, and I'll remove the heart of the stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Right? Friends, do you know what story follows this promise of God? the famous Ezekiel 37, if you're familiar, in the next chapter, you read about the dry bones in the valley, right? That's not random. That represent the Israelites, us, who are dead spiritually. But do you know how they became a mighty army of God, as verse 10 of chapter 37 supports? Through the life-giving word of God and his breath, spirit, Because those dry bones cannot come back to life by their own power. So, friends, to be born of water and the Spirit means that we must be born of the Holy Spirit who cleanses us from all our sin. Amen? And gives us, who are spiritually dead, a new living heart so that we might be able to respond to the gospel with faith and thus live as his great army. Because it is the Holy Spirit alone who washes and revives the dead sinners. And friends, think about this. Just as you have no control whatsoever over your physical birth, do you? No, thank you. You can do one single thing. One single thing about your spiritual birth. You don't cause it. You don't make it happen. What contribution did you make to your physical birth? Think about this. Oh, you know what? I want to be, I want to, right, I want to be born again, or I want to be born, so I'll convince my mother or whatever. None. Your parents, especially, thank you, mothers, right? Your, uh, your mothers did everything from the beginning till the end. And the same is true of the new birth, regeneration. And this is the point that Jesus is making here. We sinners who are spiritually dead do not contribute anything to our spiritual birth. Right? There's nothing you can do about it. We don't make or cause ourselves to be born again. You can't even choose to be born again. Because a sinner, again, who is dead in sin is unable to do anything concerning the things of God, including belief in Jesus. So regeneration is not up to us. It's not up to our choice, will, ability. And this is why the new birth is the sovereign, it's up to the Holy Spirit, and gracious work of the Holy Spirit alone. Ultimately, Jesus tells us that, number three, the Holy Spirit's work of the new generation, um, new birth or regeneration is mysterious uncontrollable again you don't have control over it over it and yet it is always perceivable you can tell and effective because it is a holy spirit right we're not effective but he is amazing verse verse 8 um thank you verse 8 here we go the wind blows where it wishes and you're you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Why, why does Jesus talk about wind? According to D.A. Carson, friends, both the Hebrew word ruach and the Greek word pneuma can mean both wind and the Spirit. And Jesus, in order to help us understand the nature of the Holy Spirit's work of the new birth, compares the Holy Spirit to the wind 
and points out the similarities between the two. What are the characteristics of wind? The wind is mysterious. The wind is uncontrollable. And this was more true for those people in the time of Jesus when modern science and technology were not available, right? And Jesus says we, or at least people in the days of Jesus, don't really understand where it comes from. It is invisible. And no person can either start or stop it. However, although we cannot see and fully understand the wind, how it works, we can all perceive its effects, right? We can all perceive that. We hear its sound, we feel it on our skin, and we see the flowers and branches swaying in the wind. And the same is true, friends, of the Holy Spirit's work of the new birth. It is mysterious. You don't really know when and how the new birth takes place in your life. Also, it is uncontrollable. Again, you don't make it happen, friends. I got saved when I was 12 in Brazil, right? I was attending a youth retreat uh, at that time, and on this particular evening, I was singing a worship song um, with other kids. And all of a sudden, I realized that I was a sinner. Man, I'm a sinner, and that I needed Jesus Christ. So I accepted him. I still remember in that corner, right? as my Savior, and I prayed a prayer of repentance and thanksgiving in tears. Now, very important, I don't know when exactly the Holy Spirit gave me the new birth. That's the point that I want to make. So that I might respond to the gospel with faith and sing that worship song in that way and thus be saved. Maybe it was right before I accepted Jesus, maybe 30 seconds before. Right? Or maybe it was the night before I went to retreat. Or maybe it was when I was 10. I don't know. But that's the right answer, you see, according to Jesus. So no, you don't have to know. Right? And probably you won't know the moment of the new birth. Though you may know what? The time when you were saved. The time when you were converted. Because the new birth and conversion are two different things, right? Because I remember when I was 12, I accepted Jesus as conversion. But the, again, the new birth, I don't know. But this work, friends, of the Spirit is, yes, it was mysterious, right? Uncontrollable, but it is also perceivable, right? How is it perceivable? Do you see things? No. Well, now I, once a dead sinner, who used to be hostile to the truths of God, at best indifferent to the things of God, now I love the Bible. Now I appreciate the Bible. You see, now I can trust in the Bible. And that's how you can tell. And we're going to talk about this in more detail, about Salva assurance of salvation. How can you have assurance of salvation? We're going to talk about that later. But one of the points is this. Now you love Jesus, the things of Jesus. And this work is also 100% effective. If the Holy Spirit did give you, friends, the new birth, you will certainly and inevitably believe in Jesus eventually. You will. And thus be saved. It's, in, it's impossible for anyone who was born again to not believe in the gospel because the Holy Spirit's work of the new birth is what? Mysterious, uncontrollable, and yet it is always perceivable and effective. Friends, do you know what passage we find in John 3.16? Our passage was John 3, 1 through 8, right? John, same chapter, 3.16. Does the reference John 3.16 sound familiar? The famous John 3.16, you need to know this, utterly depends on what we learn today. Right? People quote the Bible out of, out of context. 
It utterly, completely depends on this text. Immediately after explaining to, to Nicodemus the absolute necessity and importance of the new birth, and only then, he talks about the new birth first. This is not up to you. This is my work, the work of the Spirit alone. You don't, control, you, you, you don't have control over this. And then, only then, Jesus says in John 3, 6, 16, that anyone who believes in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. So anyone, we need to define anyone. Anyone here refers only to those who are born again. Because... As we learned, a sinner who is spiritually dead and doesn't have, and thus doesn't have the Holy Spirit, cannot believe in Jesus. Cannot. This means then, friends, if you are able to understand and believe in the things of God, the gospel, then what? Praise the Holy Spirit. Thank the Holy Spirit. Worship the Holy Spirit. Who cleansed and revived your dead soul. And clearly, all three persons of the Trinity are involved in our salvation, right? It's not just about Jesus, the Father. What does the Holy Spirit do? Well, the Father plans salvation, right? We're going to talk about election too. The Son accomplishes it for us on the cross, and then the Holy Spirit applies to us. So, by the grace of God, may we continue to love. Follow, obey, please, and be filled with, yes, the Father, yes, Jesus, but also with the Holy Spirit who gives us, who are spiritually dead, the precious new birth so that we might be able to repent and believe in Jesus and thus live an eternal life. Let's pray, dear friends. Please close your eyes. Let us pray and talk to the Holy Spirit. Say, thank you, Holy Spirit, for the new birth. I want to praise you, the Holy Spirit, for, again, uh, regeneration. Because if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we won't be here, friends. It's not up to you. You cannot. It's meaning and purpose, right? Uh, listen to God's word concerning the Lord's Supper, which are found in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. And I will read them to you. Lis uh, listen to these words as you meditate. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death, the Lord's death, until he comes. So the Lord's Supper was established, friends, by the Lord Jesus himself. And it is to be observed by his church until he returns. It is a remembrance and proclamation of his once-for-all sacrifice for us. But at the same time, friends, it is not a mere memorial to his death. God does give us grace in the crucified resurrected and glorified Jesus through the help of the Holy Spirit as we take the Lord's Supper with faith and thanksgiving. The bread and wine represent the body and blood of Jesus, which he gave for his people. And the Lord's Supper symbolizes our union with Christ and the forgiveness of our sins. Also, in the Lord's Supper, friends, that's why you need to come to church, by the way, uh, if you're listening. Thank you, but... We want you to come. Why? Because in the Lord's Supper, believers have fellowship with and are united to one another as the members of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you trust in Jesus alone for, for your salvation and understand the meaning, the purpose, and importance of the Lord's Supper and have made a public 
profession of faith through baptism, uh, which is a sign of our participation in Jesus, his death and resurrection, as the Lord commanded us, then this supper is for you. At the same time, friends, God's word, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29 says this. Listen, right? Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Then... And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So we don't want to take this lightly. So friends, if you do not trust in Jesus alone as your Savior, or you are living a sinful lifestyle and and refusing to repent, I'm not saying you must be sinless. You shouldn't be taking the Lord's Supper. For God's word warns us that we're not to take the elements in an unworthy manner and that we're to carefully examine ourselves before we take them. And now it is my privilege as a minister of Christ to invite all of you who have accepted Jesus as their Savior and are baptized to take the Lord's Supper. Again, if you're baptized uh, as an infant but you never went through uh, the uh, confirmation process, we, we ask that you go through that process first, and then you can take it. We're doing this every month, so it's okay. We can do it next month, okay? That's more important than taking the, the Lord's Word without the knowledge and, and, and confidence. Um, we're going to take the bread first and then the wine and please wait until I ask you to eat and, and drink them because we, we're going to do so in unison together at the same time. Our deacons will be serving the bread and the wine. And during distribution, everyone, whether you are participating in it uh, or not, uh, must be preparing themselves as a members, receive the elements by praying a prayer of repentance, prayer of thanksgiving, and meditating on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Then uh, let us take a few moments. Um, You're going to hear a sound, a song now. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads, and take a few moments to prepare and examine ourselves by, again, repenting of our sins and thanking God for Jesus' sacrifice for us. Okay? Let's be praying. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, for his sacrifice, for his flesh and blood that saved us from our sin. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your passion. And because of the death of Jesus Christ, now we're here rejoicing in the Lord. Unworthy sinners, praise God. Praise the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. But God, we repent of our sins. Help us to examine ourselves. Cleanse us from our sin, O Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus Christ. Help us to love you, Jesus. Follow you, Jesus, closely. 
obey you out of love. Draw us closer to you, O oh God, please. Now as we take the body and blood of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, be with us and bless us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. As I, ministering in his name, give this bread to you. In the same way, our Savior also took the cup, and having uh, given thanks, as uh, has been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples. As I, ministering in his name, give this cup to you. Please, deacons, uh, pass around the, the elements. Thank you. Again, please continue to pray and take the element, but do not um, take it yet. We want to take it together, and I'll explain to you how we're going to do so. Let me briefly explain. You're going to see the lid right now. Uh, please remove the lid and keep the lid. Um, and um, after you drink the cup, uh, we want to dispose it together. There's a basket uh, in the back, so uh, take it out. And please hold on to the bread for now. Everyone hold on to the bread. Um, if you need more time, I'll give you more time. Anyone needs more time? It's hard. There are two lids, right? You guys figure it, figure it out? Yeah, you can, you can take it. Um, right, to minimize contact, we chose to do it this way, so please um, be understanding, but thank you for understanding. Um, okay, I think we're ready, right? Uh, our Lord Jesus said, take, eat, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take it together. Let's take it. Yes. Uh, Our Lord Jesus also said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Now let's grab the cup and pull down the mask and let us drink the wine. Thank you. Uh, now deacons can cover the elements. We will be uh, meditating. Let's continue to meditate. Pray. Thank God and worship our Lord Jesus in silence um, as we give back to the Lord. So please, ushers, come forward. And let's be praying, let's be meditating. Dear Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who gave us the new birth so that we may believe in Christ. I thought it was me, but no, I was wrong. It was the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Holy Spirit. Please, Holy Spirit, continue to empower us to love Christ, follow Christ closely. Oh, Holy Spirit, be with us always, as you promised us. Oh, Jesus, we love you, Jesus. Thank you for being our friend and Lord. And of course, thank you for your sacrifice, which is why all of us are alive. Oh, Jesus, forgive us our sins. Help us to love you more. Help us to be filled with you. Fill our minds and hearts with you alone more and more. We thank you, oh God, for providing for us. We have everything we need so abundantly. You're so generous, oh God. Oh God, increase our faith. Help us to give back to you. Honor you with our possessions and help those who are suffering. And you continue to provide for us. So increase our faith, our little faith. May the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit who gives us the new birth be with you now and forever. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. Praise God. I'll see you next. Oh, yes, there's basket. Uh, in the back, please, on your way out, please dispose um, the cup. Thank you.